introducing Dr. Barrett. He's the chief of the stem cell allogeneic transplant section at the NHLBI <coughs> hematology branch at NIH. He received his medical training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London and was professor of hematology at several hospitals in Europe prior to coming to the NIH in 19, excuse me, 1993. His research has involved numerous clinical protocols involving T-cell depletion and graft manipulation to optimize GVL and minimize GVHD. Most recently, his research has focused on the engineering of leukemic-specific T-cells. At the NIH, Dr. Barrett is instrumental in the training of fellows and PAs and NPs. He is by far my favorite speaker, and I'm so happy that he can be with us today. Excuse me. So, actually, I have to say, Teresa is my favorite AP, PA. Thank you very much. Um, so, I ran all the way here, but I have got my breath back now. Click on my name. Oh, yeah, that's my name. Okay, and click on the slide. All right, so my task is to talk about relapse after transplantation. And um, it's important. And the next sl slide shows you why. Um, it's the single biggest cause of death after stem cell transplantation for malignant disease. And, of course, we're talking about allogeneic transplantation. A little bit that way? Okay. All right. You can hear me now? Yeah. So that's why we need to talk about relapse. It's, after all, what we try and do is to set out to cure patients of malignant disease and if we keep failing one third of the time, then there's clearly something we have to do to address it. And when you look at relapse, there's a couple of points here in the next two slides. First is that nothing has really changed in the last 30, 40 years. You see on the white line data from 1975 and in the green line data from 1995 showing that despite all the stuff that you hear about, we're not actually doing very well in terms of improving the 20% relapse rate that you see in patients with early disease. I mean, typically patients in first remission and uh, patients uh, uh, with myelodysplasia uh, without uh, any advanced disease or excess of blasts. And second point is that if you've got bad disease, your relapse rate is 60%. It's remained 60% and uh, there's no evidence that we've really advanced the field. So um, this is the next piece of bad news that we really need to take on board, uh, especially as more and more we get patients who have failed other treatments, who are coming to us for transplantation. Unfortunately, as Dr. Applebaum showed last night, there's more patients who actually are, being, are missing the chance of the optimum transplant by being transplanted at the right time. And so there are many patients like this who come to us with a very high relapse probability. So lots of work to be done. Let's look at the other side of the coin and think about cure. So what, what do we mean by cure? You know, we sort of, in simplistic terms, we like to think of uh, the heavy treatment that we give and all that immunity getting rid of the last malignant cell, and that's what cure is. But there's reason to think that it may not be so simple as that. There may still be some small residue of undetectable disease that still sits around in the bone marrow that can occasionally break out. And so uh, certainly for some diseases like chronic myeloid leukemia, where you can see relapses, up to 20 years after the transplant, the feeling is that there may still be residual disease left behind. And if there is, what is it that controls it? What is it that keeps that disease at bay most of the time to produce what we would call an operational cure? So here's two models of cure. This is the hematopoietic tree with the uh, uh, mature cells that go into the blood on the right-hand side of the box, the smaller compartment of developing maturing cells in the marrow right down to the committed cells and right down to the very early stem cells which are quiescent, very small compartment of them, but those are the ones which of course drive hematopoiesis. And if there's malignant hematopoiesis in that, one simple idea of cure is that with the treatment, one-time eradication gets rid of all the residual stem cells and we've got a cure. The other 
approach, as I've suggested, is that there's some sort of steady state control, that the transplant comes in and doesn't quite get round to the root of the problem, if you like. You get rid of a lot of disease, and it's replaced by donor hematopoiesis, but it comes back again, but then GVL takes care of it, and it stays away. So those are the two conflicting ideas about relapse and, uh, relapse and cure that we should bear in mind when we think about the dynamics of what's happening after transplantation. So back to relapse. What are the characteristics of relapse? It's really, despite the sort of uh, hype and worry, mostly it is the recurrence of the same disease. There is a small proportion of relapses which are actually not relapses. They're, for some reason or another, the induction of leukemia in the donor, uh, whether that's to do with the environment that the donor cells find themselves in, some mysterious form of gene transfer between the residual leukemia and the donor, it's not clear. But uh, in studies, for example, with cord blood, where you can actually know how many cord bloods were distributed and how many le leukemias derived from the cord uh, were actually observed, it's quite a bit less than 5%, uh, and the mechanism for it we still don't quite know. So we're really going to be mainly talking about disease recurrence in its simple terms. And as I've said, the time course of the disease recurrence can be rather variable. CML can give you surprises very late out. The acute leukemias, by and large, tend to uh, declare themselves if they're going to relapse within three years. So we can talk about much more confidently cure at five years uh, in the acute leukemias. And don't forget that although the bone marrow is usually the reservoir of these diseases, you can also get, particularly in AMLs, extra medullary relapses where leukemia cells have uh, hidden out in the tissues and can relapse from the extra medullary site. Uh, and some of these are very atypical. Um, curiously, you see relapses of AML in the kidneys, uh, you know, not, not just uniquely, but uh, quite repetitively. Uh, and it makes you wonder whether some tissues of the body are, in fact, immune-protected sites that prevent the donor immune system reaching and eliminating the leukemia cells there. What about the mechanisms of relapse? As I've suggested, immune control really matters, and so the leukemia can adapt to that and can escape from the control of T cells and, and uh, NK cells by, um, by mutating away and down-regulating uh, surface markers which uh, make them uh, susceptible to uh, lymphocyte control. And that's part of the process of clonal progression or is it clonal selection? In other words, when you do the transplant, are the seeds of the relapse already sitting in the population of leukemia cells? And it's probably a bit of both. It gives you the impression that if you can get rid of disease rapidly, you don't leave much time for the leukemia to grow into more malignant clones. But you can still be disappointed because at, at transplant, you can still have a family of uh, of uh, clones that are much more able to survive and are going to eventually proliferate and relapse. And then there's the concept that the leukemia hasn't really changed, but the GVL effect for some reason or another fades out and allows residual disease to break out again. We don't actually know the answer to all of these, but these are sort of things to bear in mind when you think about relapsing patients. We do know in this rather uh, uh, sort of complicated and... Uh, colorful cartoon, uh, that leukemias do notice the immune control because when AML relapses after a haploidentical transplant, what you see, this is a mismatched transplant where this is the shared haplotype of the donor and the patient's AML, and here's the mismatched haplotype where we think all the GVL activity is going on. You're going to have CD4, CD8s, and NK cells all vigorously attacking the leukemia through this mismatched, powerful mismatched allo response, which also involves the NK cells. Now, when you, um, uh, the leukemia doesn't like this, and it, if it can escape from immune control, it will. And we've seen leukemias that downregulate the very HLA molecules that are responsible for the aggression against it, so that the CD4, CD8 cells can no longer do anything, and the NK cells are not so aggressive and perhaps balanced by the negative effect of the NK cells seeing their, their corresponding HLA molecule and, and not delivering a killing signal. 
So the sum total is that the GVL effect is grossly reduced and the leukemia can escape. So this is one known mechanism whereby leukemias do escape the immune control. All right, so much for the biology. What are we going to do about it? The strategies that uh, we have to prevent or treat relapse are illustrated here. And it starts at the potential of cure at the top and comes down to a very thin wedge at the bottom. And so, although we're not really going to talk about it because it's uh, to do with conditioning regimen and how you do the transplant, prevention is always better than cure. And if we are really going to do research into relapse, uh, although we have to address these, this problem of the 30% 30, 30 failure, really we should not forget that we've got to design our treatment protocols to prevent relapse ever occurring. And just to briefly uh, outline those, those possibilities, you've heard uh, quite a bit at this meeting that uh, getting the patient into a complete negative disease state before the transplant, however you do it, is sort of naturally pretty uh, favorable to preventing the disease come back. So if you go into the transplant with blasts on board, you're going to have a much higher chance of relapse. So what you do before the transplant really matters. How you do that, of course, is uh, subject to a lot of research. The conditioning has to do two things. It's got to be anti-leukemic to the greatest strength you think the patient can take. And this involves this whole question of the uh, older patient and how much we have to reduce the intensity of the regimen and how much we can let it creep up so that we can get the control we want. And, of course, the other thing conditioning has to do is let the graft in and allow early donor immune recovery to get that GVL effect working very fast. And you can still do things post-transplant, particularly now with targeted drugs. You can, for example, use imatinib for Philadelphia positive ALL and keep that in as an extra control of residual disease. For myelodysplastic syndromes, you can use 5-azocytidine. And there's a number of uh, approaches which are very important in, in preventing relapse. The other thing is you can preempt relapse. So after the transplant, you may have some warning signs uh, you may have ways to detect minimal residual disease, or you may see falling chimerism, which suggests that uh, something is uh, not well and that there is patient uh, material coming back into the blood. Or you can actually track residual disease by flow cytometry. So that's another moment at which you can attack before the disease really relapses. And finally, you have the event itself where you have to take uh, uh, some therapeutic uh, means to control it. So what about the timing of relapse? This is a very important uh, uh, feature of relapse. It's from our own data, but everybody else sees the same thing. And again, it sort of makes sense. Relapse early after transplant within the first six months carries the worst prognosis, and that's the blue line here in the middle. And you can see that the composition of the uh, patients is the same. There's the, the blue is um, uh, AML, the, the magenta is CML, uh, the uh, B-cell disease are the light blue, and the MDS is the brown. And there's not really much difference in the type of disease that relapse, but the timing is everything. So relapsing later than six months, and in fact, later than a year is even better, you get much better outcomes. Uh, that's, uh, as I say, our own data recently analyzed. When you uh, think about how you treat relapse, you do have three modalities, and you need them all because this is a, a very uh, gloomy situation. You need immunotherapy, you need chemotherapy, and you need targeted drugs if you've got them. And so, really, you should think about how you can uh, use all these agents together, if at all possible. And I'm going to talk about these various approaches. So what about chemotherapy? When you have an acute leukemia that relapses post-graft, the first thing that you uh, want to do if you're going to try and treat it is to go back to straightforward chemotherapy to, to bulk reduce the disease. And of course, post-transplant patients are not new patients. They're not... Uh, so robust, their tissues have been through a lot of treatment, and so the sort of regimens that we've been using to reinduce remissions or to re bulk reduce the disease are really fairly basic. 
uh, ALL, for example, vincristine, Dorna, Rubicin, prednisone is a very good way to start disease control. The use of clofarabine, which seems to be a very good drug, although it has its toxicities, uh, can also be very helpful. Rituximab is great for any disease that uh, has a CD20 on, on the surface. For AML, combinations of cytosine, fludarabine, idorubicin, uh, these uh, flag regimens uh, are very helpful, very appropriate for initial treating of uh, relapsed acute leukemia. And then for the lymphomas, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and CLL, again, rituximab, fludarabine, cytoxan, bendamustine, good agents which uh, are really non-controversial and will get you some disease control. But before doing that, should, should we ask the question, when you have a relapse, is it really worth uh, going ahead and doing anything with it? And there is a study which says, yes, chemotherapy does buy you something. Uh, these are patients relapsing after stem cell transplantation for AM, acute, and, yeah, acute myeloid leukemia. And if you just use palliation, that would be giving a bit of hydroxyurea now and then to control the counts. You have, of course, no remissions, and the one-year survival is 7%. If you use your salvage chemo, it's really quite dramatic. You can get the complete remissions, even at this phase after transplant, uh, and correspondingly increase in the, the one-year survival. So that's something you can say to your patients. Look, a bit of chemotherapy can help you. It's not going to cure you for a long time, but you will get uh, uh, some, we will buy you time for it. Uh, it's even better with pediatric leukemias and should always remember you know, that treating children uh, can be much more rewarding in that way because of their tremendous robustness to uh, receiving more treatment and uh, uh, their ability to bounce back. Uh, so here's salvage chemo in the context of pediatric uh, acute, uh, acute myeloid leukemia again in 49 patients, 72% complete remissions, again 30% five-year survival. Um, but note here, and I'm going to come back to this, that uh, three patients who got second transplants, uh, three out of three died from second, after second transplant. So second transplants have their toxicity. But all in all, I think these are very important figures to know, that it, it really uh, enforces the importance of actually trying for some sort of treatment for your patient to give them some prolonged survival. So let's talk about second transplants. We uh, at the NIH decided that every time we had a patient who relapsed, uh, we would consider transplantation, a second transplant from the same donor, as an option and offer it to them as a potential, a second chance of cure, if you like. Uh, we did this because most of our transplants are T-cell depleted and we would offer them a T-replete graft from the same donor with the argument that they would be better off next time because we would provide a better, stronger graft versus leukemia effect. So we, we looked at uh, 59 patients uh, who'd relapsed after transplantation in the last decade and uh, it turned out that 13 uh, of, the, of, the, of the patients who relapsed less than six months, 13 received transplants and 25 did not. And after, after six months, there were 12 transplants and nine who didn't receive stem cell transplantation. You can see already a bias that the more favorable leukemias uh, in terms of their relapse timing were the ones who got the transplants. But interestingly, when we compared the two groups, uh, and this was not a randomization, uh, the selection was not very obvious. There were very similar sorts of patients uh, that fell into either the transplant or non-transplant group. One of the findings of this, of course, we used a number of different conditioning regimens, and some patients we gave myeloablative conditioning with high-dose busulfan and fludarabine. Others got much more reduced uh, uh, regimens. And you can see that actually, if anything, the myeloablative conditioning was not unfavorable, although you should remember that this is not a, a, a randomized comparison. But the disappointing thing, uh, and this has really changed our, our practice, is that when you compare the outcome of the patients who relapsed, the, uh, who had the second transplant, this is in the first six months, there's no difference in survival between those that got the transplant and those that did not. And the only thing that second transplant did for the later relapses was to prolong their survival by a few months. 
And so this, uh, when we looked at the data, we looked very carefully to see if we'd been biasing things. And if we, there was any bias at all, it was towards choosing the better, stronger patients for the transplant. Uh, and if even that did not uh, amount to a better outcome, uh, it really made us say, we're not going to do any more second transplants for patients who relapse. What about other treatments then? Well, the immune approach, response to donor lymphocyte infusion. Now, uh, 30 years ago, the first evidence that you could actually get remissions with DLI, but particularly in uh, favorable diseases, in chronic myeloid leukemia, which largely, of course, is not on the transplant charts much. Chronic lymph lymphocytic leukemia is and can respond very well to DLI. There's intermediate diseases here, the, the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, MDS can sometimes respond. ALL, Hodgkin's disease, high-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma have very poor responses just to an infusion of donor lymphocytes. But there are ways to um, do a bit better with donor lymphocyte infusions. You can work on the patient before the, trans before the DLI. That can involve, of course, um, immunoablative treatment where you're going to now reset the immune clock, get rid of all the useless T cells that let the, let the leukemia back and come in with a nice fresh set of, of lymphocytes. You can of course myeloablate and in the process reduce the uh, bulk of the disease. Uh, you can go for the DLI itself. You can try and reduce GVHD by selecting just the CD4 cells. You can use techniques which selectively deplete alloreacting cells. You can use uh, lymphocytes that have been stimulated in some way. You can also use uh, lymphocytes that you've gene manipulated. And after the DLI, you can still do things. You can give cytokines like interferon in particular or GMCSF, which can really increase the cytotoxicity of the DLI that you've just administered. You can give 5-azocytidine, which upregulates tumor antigens on uh, MDS cells and myeloid cells at least. You can give lenalidomide to just another rather nonspecific immune stimulator. Or you can come in with your targeted therapies. So what about preemptive? Here's uh, data from uh, um, 113 patients who uh, received, uh, oh sorry, yes, I'm going back now to preemptive DLI, which uh, is when you begin to give the DLI as soon as you can after the risk of GVHD or GVHD has been treated. And you can see that there is a benefit from giving DLIs uh, before the disease actually relapses. Um, there's actually less GVHD than giving it when the patient relapses and you can get a better survival uh, compared with a, a match group of individuals who only got their DLI when they relapsed. So the earlier you give the DLI, the better. Another thing before the DLI, which is pretty well routine, but has now been studied in a number of uh, uh, trials, whether you give chemotherapy or not, you can actually uh, get a better outcome if you give chemotherapy and try and get remission before you treat with the DLI. And so DLI, DLI, sorry, chemotherapy followed by DLI is really a standard that you should try and follow uh, whenever you can. What about lymphodepletion, just focusing on reducing the donor's uh, original population and coming back with the fresh, untolerized lymphocytes? Here's a study which shows that if you do lymphodeplete, and that's using fludarabine and, uh, to, to do so, you can actually, uh, uh, you do get graft versus host disease, but you can achieve about 40%, 50% uh, remissions, and again, a one-year survival in the range of about 30%. But another thing which um, uh, uh, has been very promising and developed uh, particularly by the Italian group in Milan is to do gene therapy. You take the T cells from the DLI, you modify them with a suicide gene such that when you put in a large transfusion of lymphocytes, uh, which can of course induce graft versus host disease, which, have, which happened here, you can treat the patient with gancyclovir, which switches on the suicide gene and kills the lymphocytes. But by that time, they've done their job. And as in this patient with CMML, the burden of disease disappeared and went into a complete remission. So you have control of a large dose of potentially leukemic aggressive uh, DLI cells. After the DLI, 
you can think about upregulating the antigen on the leukemias using 5-ASA or decitabine. You can stimulate the T cells with lenalidomide or bortezomib. And you can continue with your anti-tumor treatment. Um, Sirolimus, for example, has an interesting effect not just against GBHD, but appears to be effective uh, against non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in its own right. Uh, Rituxan, very good for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And, of course, the Philadelphia positive diseases uh, can be controlled further with imatinib or dasatinib. But perhaps uh, what I would like to think uh, we will be doing a lot more in the future is actually to make cells that are specifically anti-leukemic. And you can do that either recognizing minor antigens on the uh, surface of the malignancy or generating T cells that recognize tumor antigens. Or, of course, you can do, again, more genetic manipulation and link the T cell through um, uh, its receptor to uh, either CD19, CD20, or CD33 to target myeloid or lymphoid cells, or use co combinations of all these with vaccines as well. So uh, just to show you that it has been done, and this is a very complicated chart because it was a very complicated approach, but just very briefly, and this is work from Seattle, you can take the patient and make lymphocyte, the dendritic cells from them before uh, you start the transplant. You can take lymphocytes from the donor before the transplant and use those dendritic cells to stimulate the allo response of the donor. Then you can make clones of cells and you uh, laboriously check out all the clones that you've made and test them for their uh, function against leukemia, obviously, and in this case, clone J47 actually killed the patient's leukemia, which you also kept back, didn't kill the patient's fibroblasts, so it gave you some leukemia specificity, and when you put the leukemia in the mice and you put the clones in, the mice survived and didn't catch leukemia. And they went on to actually, through a complicated process, actually identify what it was that the T cells saw, and they came out with the minor antigen uh, which uh, they were able to find the alleles of. And so in this way, they actually found a new minor antigen and they found a way that you could actually make clones that were minor antigen specific. Another approach which uh, has actually pioneered in our lab by Gerrit Weber uh, was to make mixtures of, of very common tumor antigens, and this is for AML. Uh, so we took peptides made from uh, these uh, five antigens, which uh, are all frequently expressed in myeloid leukemias. We made dendritic cells from the donor. We uh, took peripheral blood cells from the donor, and we laced the dendritic cells with all these peptides. We used a very big cocktail of cytokines, and in that system in culture, we were able to generate multi-leukemia antigen-specific T cells, which we, we could hopefully in the future deliver to patients who've relapsed and target the uh, tumor antigens on them. Uh, it certainly works in uh, uh, a situation where um, uh, Hodgkin's disease uh, expresses EBV antigens, and so you can generate these EBV-specific T cells, which also target Hodgkin's cells, as you can see here in a relapsed post-transplant condition where the pre and the post show the disappearance of the disease. Uh, as has been done in Baylor uh, College in Houston. Uh, and this is the results of their treatment uh, using these uh, Hodgkin's disease-specific uh, uh, T-cells, which uh, were given to patients who relapsed, 23 of them. Uh, they were infused with these CTLs, and you can see that over 50% got complete remissions um, the, uh, and a few partial remissions, and, and some who didn't, and nine who got progressive disease. But these responses were very durable. So this is very exciting that there is something really powerful out there to use. Uh, and this is the survival post um, relapse of these patients. And can't do a talk about tumor specific cells without mentioning the. Uh, the CAR cells, which uh, uh, are a piece of sophisticated uh, uh, genetic engineering where you link this monoclonal antibody to the TCR complex, and in that way the T cell that homes onto its target uh, does so by, through its antigen, but once it gets close in, the T cell can engage and uh, kill the tumor cell. There are... Um, 
uh, now 13 studies that are open uh, or about to open that are using CD19 car cells for lymphoid malignancies. Here they are. And uh, they all use slightly different technologies and nobody's quite sure which is the right car to, to buy. But we will see as these studies go on. But the conclusion is that actually um, with this type of technology at least B cell malignancies can now be targeted. Uh, the hope is that CD33, which targets a, a lot of myeloid malignancies, might be another vehicle uh, for uh, attack, attaching car molecules to. So, in conclusion, relapse after transplantation is a huge problem. The immunotherapy, I think, is really the main uh, treatment approach, although, as you can see, you need the conventional approaches to reduce tumor bulk to begin with. And I have to say, the best strategy is not to waste too much time on researching how to treat relapse, but to use those opportunities for relapse that your unfortunate patients give you to perfect treatments that you can ultimately use to come in after the transplant before the relapse even begins to be a thought in the leukemia's head. So with that, I'll leave it and, uh, open for questions.